and information, often we, uh, we forget to try and get some extra information. So you can get that uh, from the hospital records. If you have a patient details, you can get their medical record from their previous attendances. If you have time, you can even ring their family doctor to find out what medications they are, what's their past medical history. Um, and the paramedics, you can also, sometimes if they're not too busy doing compressions or doing something else, then you can get some extra information out of them as well before the patient arrives. And that really helps you to do a kind of pre-debrief with your team. So when you're getting your team ready, you want to assign roles, um, you want to think about what might happen with this patient. So you can try and anticipate in what way things are going to go. You might be expecting that things are going to be quite easy and go well, or going to be very difficult and go very badly, or end up with uh, an unhappy outcome. But either way, by sending your team, you're kind of giving them some insights into what might happen. When you're allocating roles, you know, you have to think about the capabilities and the training of the people. So there's no point giving the intubation to your medical student, you know, there's no point um, in giving difficult roles to people who are unqualified for them. And also, it would be very good to define the role, so not just say, you're the airway doctor, but to say, you're the airway doctor, what I think we should do is have maximum two attempts at laryngoscopy. If they don't need intubation, we'll just stick with bag valve mask and toilet, you know. And our plan B would be, we're going to go to laryngeal mask, or plan B is I'm going to step in and um, have a try at putting the tube in myself. So by defining what you expect people to do, then there's no surprises and no one's um, getting hit with any unexpected requests during the resuscitation. So now we'll move our focus to the patient. So the patient may either be actually dead which is not your fault, and whatever process has started to result in cardiac arrest, just be aware that you're not involved in that process. Um, by the time they come in with full CPR in progress, most of the time it's too late. So don't feel bad in yourself about something that you've done wrong. Um, what you're trying to do often will be uh, futile and often will be part of a process of grieving rather than a medical process. So they might be actually deceased, or they might be in trouble. So if they're in trouble, you stick with your structure, supporting airway, breathing, circulation, disability. And what are you going to do? You can follow the algorithms for CPR if you need it, or you're going to look for reversible causes. So just shout out some H's and T's for me. H's. Hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia. Hyperkalemia. H plus. Yes, I like that one. I like to use this little picture just to um, sort of remind me of some of those H's and T's. So I'm thinking, are they hypothermic? Are they hypoxic? Hypokalemia. Hypokalemia. Your colleagues might think that you're saying a little prayer. Um, it is one way of just trying to visualize those H's and T's rather than try and remember them off the top of your head. Because when you're stressed, your brain doesn't work properly. So what if you've actually got full CPR in progress? That's when you use your advanced life support algorithm. You guys have different looking ones. Um, they're all based across the world, they're all based on the same treatment recommendations from the 2010 ill core uh, recommendations. But the idea is that you have a common hymn sheet that you're all seeing from, you have the same information and a shared mental model. So they're the people that do kind of uh, research in this stuff, talk about shared mental models. Um, and your team really should all be on the same page about what you're doing and, and where you're going. So during that, it's quite useful to have someone to keep an eye on the time. This could be the person who's writing down the events as they go. They can tell you, that's two minutes, that's four minutes. Um, do you want us to give more adrenaline, etc.? 
uh, tracking where you are in the algorithm. So ideally you have someone looking after those mechanical aspects of the resuscitation. So things just keep happening like a machine, just keep moving. And you also want someone who's controlling the interactions. And ideally that's a team leader. If you're very lucky, you might have someone who is supervising the team leader um, to give them some feedback on their leadership style, etc. That's kind of a luxury. Um, but really you want someone to be managing the interactions. And if someone in the team is having alien thoughts, or you get an alien coming into the room, like someone who wasn't there for the beginning of the team, let's say someone from the hospital is very important, who walks in, who wants to take over, and what do you do with them? There's a leadership challenge. So you have to assert yourself as the leader and say, Hello, I'm the team leader. Um, you're from Anesthetics? Okay. Um, and then you give them a job. So you say, Can I get you to supervise my airway doctor? Or can I get you to take over the airway? Or can I get you to look after vascular access and fluid resuscitation? And that way, you're involving them, you're asking for help, being respectful. You're not saying, go away, we don't need you. You can engage with them. Because if you back down and make it not clear who's the leader, things are going to go badly. Because the team needs to know who's in charge. And it doesn't matter that you're young and inexperienced, or you've never done it before. It's important that someone's in charge. And someone is controlling the information from a central hub. So that's going to be you most of the time. And if you get a leadership challenge, either you seek control, say, thanks very much, Professor, you know, super duper, can I, can I make you the team leader? Yes, okay. Okay, team, Professor so-and-so is the leader now. And then you step back or ask for a role. So it needs to be very clear at all times who the team leader is. If you're lucky enough to get a return of spontaneous circulation, then you're going to be sending the patient to the pediatric intensive care unit. I have no idea whether we should be doing therapeutic hypothermia or not. I think Jean's going to tell us later on today. But uh, that's something that needs to be discussed with your intensive care colleagues. So there's the team leader conducting the orchestra from the centre of the hub. Now at some point, you're going to need to shift your attention from the patient to the family. And this is regardless of whether things are going well or things are not going well. Remember that the child is really part of the picture, the, either the mother-infant mother dyad or they're part of the family uh, that they uh, function within. So you need to involve the family really early on. At some point you need to think, do we need to stop? So is this a futile resuscitation? You've had a systole for 20 minutes, 30 minutes. The chance of complete neurologic recovery is zero. And do we need to gently talk about stopping? So how do you do that? The best way is to summarize to your team what's happened, how long you've been going, what have we done, what have been the responses to those interventions, and what do we expect is going to happen? And then you consult with your team. So this is not commanding the team, not telling them what's going to happen. It's also not waiting for a consensus where you've got 100% agreement. But you're asking for ideas. So I think we've done this and that, and I think that this is futile. Um, I think that we need to think about stopping soon. I think that we're going to need to uh, withdraw from this resuscitation. Does anyone else have any other ideas? Is there anything we haven't thought of? We've thought of reversible causes, hypovolemia, hypothermia, um, etc. And there might be a great idea to come out from the team or something that you haven't thought of, which is good. You can use that. So you're consulting with your team to get more ideas. And you're shifting your focus to the family, who need to be present. Now, they may not know that they need to be there, because they may feel that they'd rather not be there. But the evidence suggests that people grieve better if they were there. They have 
um, what they imagine is always worse than reality. So it is really a good idea to have them present, but they can't be in isolation, they need to be supported. So ideally have a senior nurse or a doctor to talk to them to explain what's going on, they're doing this now, those tubes, or that, that machine, etc. So they know what's going on and they're involved in the care. And at some point, you may have to deliver some bad news. So fire a warning shot. Things are not going very well. We really um, are not very optimistic about how things are going. Um, and then be clear when you do deliver or may have to deliver um, bad news. Be very definite about what you're saying. So at the centre of this communication hub, what are the ideal attributes of a team leader? You want to be calm, attentive to your team, and clear communicator. So the study suggests that the things that make teams work well is a shared mental model, so you're all on the same page, clear communication, and clarity about who the team leader is. It's really helpful to summarize frequently. We've been going for this long, this is what we've done, given this many doses of adrenaline, as an intervention to that, no response to, we've looked for reversible causes, this is what we expect to happen. So frequently summarizing keeps the team on the same page. Eventually you're going to move as the team leader shift your focus to the team. And we're talking about debriefing essentially. This is whether you have a successful outcome or you have a, a demise that you were not able to reverse. So why do we do it? We do it for emotional support. We do it to improve the care, to um, talk about the medical aspects so that next time we can do it better. When should we do it? Well, it can start before the patient arrives. You start setting expectations about what's going to happen. Ideally, you do it within a half an hour of the resuscitation finishing, but sometimes you may need to delay it for a few days and get those people back in to talk about it. It's much better if you can do it on the same day. Who should come? We often remember our medical and nursing team, but don't forget the other people that were involved from those ancillary support services. Don't forget the pre-hospital team who were right there from the start who brought that patient in who really want to know what happened and could they have done anything differently. And how do we do it? How do we do a debriefing? Now, um, we wouldn't have time to discuss that in detail, but I like the, the concept of set dialogue and closure. So we set, we set up your environment, ideally chairs in a circle, um, introduce what's going to happen. We're going to talk about this for 20 minutes um, and then um, if anyone wants to catch me later, you can, but we're going to go back to work after that. You have a dialogue, and the dialogue is essentially summarizing this is what happened from the start, from home to hospital care, all the things you did, what happened, etc. And then that dialogue is open to the floor. Has anyone uh, got anything to add? What did we do well? What should we maybe do differently next time? And it's okay to talk about those things because you really want to make sure that the next time you do a better job. And when it comes to closure, quick summary, thanks everyone for coming, and a very clear signal that the debriefing session is finished. So that might mean getting up out of your chair, opening the door, and saying, um, I'll see you later. But there has to be a clear end to the session. And what you're doing then is recovery. So you're on the road to preparing for the next patient. So there's a continuous cycle of improvement that you've not just done the resuscitation and walked away and gone, oh, that was terrible. You spent a bit of time thinking about the medical aspects, thinking about the emotional aspects, so that next time you can do a better job. And as the team leader, just to summarize, you will next time be able to shift the patient, your focus from the patient to the family, to the team, and looking after all of those groups by being at the centre of the hub of communication. Thanks very much.